Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. As the 2012 election closes in, we discuss what's at stake for Minnesotans in this week's Capital Report. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Capital Report. I'm Julie Bartke. You couldn't miss them even if you tried. Lawn signs, billboards, promoting candidates vying for legislative and congressional seats. On November 6th, Minnesotans will elect one U.S. Senator, eight members of Congress, 67 state senators, 134 House members, and will decide yes or no on two constitutional amendments. For insight on the campaigns and the issues driving this election, we sat down with the Humphrey Institute's Dr. Larry Jacobs. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be with you. Dr. Jacobs, on October 13th, you stated to the St. Paul Pioneer Press that the Minnesota state legislative races are the most consequential uncovered political event in the state this year. What's at stake for voters? Pretty much everything. Uh, we've got some very big decisions to be made about the budget. Uh, we're going to have, again, by all projections, some kind of deficit, and so there are going to have to be decisions made on spending. Uh, in addition, we've got uh, the governor working pretty hard over the last year to come up with a major reform of taxes. Then you've got November 16th. The governor has got to send word to Washington about our intention to participate in health reform. So there are a lot of big issues here, and uh, the legislature being Republican will probably have more uh, disagreement, maybe even walk up to the edge of a government shutdown. But if it's Democratic, I think we're going to see probably one of the big uh, periods of government activism. Simply, in your opinion, is the economy the only issue that's going to have the greatest impact on this particular election? The economy is obviously uh, the number one, two, and three issue uh, for voters. But I also think in Minnesota, party identification, we've become more polarized. If you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, most of the time, more than nine out of 10 times, it's gonna drive who you vote for. And uh, you know, so th those factors are gonna come together. In certain parts of the states, other issues are important. Agriculture in the South, uh, maybe in the Colin Peterson district on the Western edge as well. Uh, up north, you've got issues regarding mining uh, and also environmental issues. But I'd say overwhelmingly that the economy is the top issue. What do you think, you, you mentioned agriculture and mining, but do you think there might be some other issues that could play into this as well, such as you know, education reform and, and as you mentioned, health care? You know, education reform just doesn't seem to be percolating the way it has in the past. It's because I think the economy is, is just cast a kind of a dominant um, gloss on everything. Uh, with mining and agriculture, those are obviously economic issues. And it, it, those are the issues that are important both up north and the south and the west uh, for folks and their jobs. When we look down at the last couple of years, statewide anyway, what do you think voters are going to remember more? Do you think they're going to remember the government shutdown or do you think the message of balancing the budget without raising taxes will resonate with voters? Government shutdown is going to always be there, uh, but it is striking when you look at the record uh, how much has been done. Uh, certainly on health reform, it looks to me like Governor Dayton is going to be pushing that forward. Uh, you know, uh, Governor Pawlenty, uh heavily criticized by Democrats for some of his budgets, but we did see a slowdown in government spending. And that may also be something, particularly on the conservative Republican side, that they look to and say, hey, we could do it. The impact on redistricting this election, let's talk a little bit about that. Several sources, including MinPost, believe that the new district maps could be favorable to the Senate DFL. Do you agree with that? Yes. Uh, the Republicans should have been advantaged by redistricting. When you look around at the suburbs where there were so-called excess voters, there was every reason to expect those uh, voters to help Republicans. The Bachman uh, Congressional District, uh, the uh, Paulson District, uh, even the Klein District, these were all the excess, so-called excess voters were. And the courts really adopted a status quo, let's not do too much change. And they kind of, I would say, uh, you know, evenly distributed those, those votes uh, in a way that probably hurt the Republicans' chances. They, they should have gotten a bang, they didn't. So how do you think this will, you're saying it's gonna hurt their chances, do you think it could hurt it to the point of 
losing control of the House and Senate. I think that's a real possibility. It's always uh, difficult to predict, and I'm not. Right. But here would be the number one issue, I think, uh, facing the legislative races, turnout. The Republicans are facing a kind of a triple t a tag team. They don't have the presidential candidate in the Republican Party investing in Minnesota. Mitt Romney does not even have a campaign office, whereas the Obama side has been up and running for over a year. That's a lot of resources, a lot of names that are being collected. The U.S. Senate race, the Republican candidate is just not running the kind of competent, strong, statewide uh, campaign that we have seen in the past from Republicans, whereas the incumbent, Amy Klobuchar, is also uh, running quite a good campaign, sometimes teaming up with Obama uh, in his campaign, but often on, their, on her own. Uh, and then you've got the two parties. The Republican Party is in real financial and organizational uh, trouble at this point. The Democratic Party, not in great shape, but in certainly in better shape. So you look at all that, and, and there's going to be a lot of muscle on the on the Democratic side to turn out the vote, whereas there may be some discouragement among Republican voters who don't see a reason to vote in races that are not competitive, and there won't be that organizational uh, triple teaming to turn them out to vote. To that point, though, Dr. Jacobs, there's a lot of money and a lot of media being spent on the constitutional amendments, particularly the same-sex marriage ban, for lack of a better phrase for it, um, the definition of marriage, I should say. Do you think that this could drive voter turnout and kind of balance the fat, balance what you had just said? Absolutely. The constitutional amendments may well uh, drive turnout, though it's unclear which way. Uh, you remember the, uh, in 2010, the big story there where Democrats didn't turn out because they were just not that excited about the Obama administration. That has continued to be an issue. It's not as big an issue in a presidential election year where people are more enthusiastic and tied in, but it remains an issue particularly among younger voters. And the, the, the kind of battle over the, how to define marriage really registers uh, with the younger voter set. It may help to drive turnout among younger folks counteracting any uh, drive by conservatives to get out their support. And so do you think these ballot initiatives help or hurt any party's effort to win legislative control? I think it probably helps both parties a bit, but I think the bigger factor here is going to be so much more organizational effort on the side of Democrats to get out the vote. It does not take a whole lot of impact. This is not, you know, monumental change. We're talking a half a percentage point could make the difference. You look back at 2010, the House races were decided by less than 700 votes in total. The Senate side, just a bit more than 2,000. Those are squeakers, and a whole lot of those squeaker races were won by Republicans. If there's just a downtick of 20, 30,000 voters at, distributed uh, strategically, that could make the difference in Republicans hanging on to both or one chamber or losing them. My last question for you, Dr. Jacobs, a few months ago when you were on the show, we spoke a little bit about the campaign season and you stated at that time that you did not think this would be a wave election. How do you feel about it now? I still don't see wave conditions. Uh, you know, obviously President Obama and, and Governor Romney are, are neck and neck. I, it doesn't seem to be any one candidate breaking. You look around the country, you see the Senate, congressional races, looking more status quo-ish than you might have expected. I think there's a decent chance we're going to end up in Washington, and perhaps even in Minnesota, with the same balance of power, which is divided government. One party controlling the executive branch and another party controlling at least one of the chambers on the legislative side. Okay, we would love to talk with you a few weeks in, in a few weeks after the elections and kind of gauge your opinions on those. So thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Good to be with you. Here to talk about the Republican message during this 2012 campaign season, we have the chair of the Minnesota Republican Party, Pat Chartridge. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Pat, let's begin with how do you think the lack of a major campaign in Minnesota by Mitt Romney may have affected your ability to get both legislative and congressional candidates elected? Well, there's no shortage of enthusiasm on the part of Republicans or more conservative and moderate-leaning independents. Uh, I think there's great enthusiasm. I think there was all throughout this election cycle, and I think it especially spiked after the first presidential debate. 
you know, looking at the survey data and the polling, uh, the presidential race is still a two, three, four, five point race, uh, depending on which survey you believe. So I think that even though that maybe the Romney campaign hasn't participated and engaged as much as I and others would have liked, I think it's much more competitive than uh, many people would have expected. But I think fundamentally, bottom line, our candidates are doing great. They're working hard. Uh, they're, they're talented, able individuals. And most important of all, they've got the right ideas and the right message for Minnesota's future. And what is that message? Uh, largely focused on we have to get this economy going. We can't have a state that's declining, that's diminished, that's less than it can be. We have to get government out of the way, back to its proper, more limited, more focused role. So we get the government doing fewer things, but doing the few things that it really has to do, do them much better than it is today. That's you know better education, keeping good teachers in the classroom, uh, it's reforming health care so that we still have the high quality uh, health care delivery that, that people in Minnesota have come to expect as a national leader, while at the same time figuring out new and more innovative ways to finance it without government getting in the middle of the doctor-patient relationship. It's you know a tax system that makes sense for our future so that we're attracting new businesses and more businesses, not government trying to direct the economy with spending from St. Paul, and it's fiscally responsible budgeting getting our state government back to a sensible, more limited scope, that we're not spending much, we're not just doing what we did last year, the year before, plus two or three or four or five, ten percent. Are you finding, and are candidates, Republican candidates, finding that some of the issues that affect us statewide, such as the government shutdown, the Viking Stadium, delayed payments to schools, are these issues that Minnesotans are conveying some concern to to candidates, or are they just kind of forgotten? And I think moved those on? are honestly more, uh, in some cases, certainly the uh, you know the government shutdown. I don't think our folks are hearing too much about that. I think that Minnesotans are mostly focused, as are most Americans, on how do we get this economy performing better, more jobs, more take-home pay, more opportunities for college graduates and families. Uh, how do we have better jobs? How do we, you know, attract new industries of the future? How do we, you know, make it easier to start and grow a business so there's more opportunity and more prosperity? And certainly, you know, the size and the role of government's a big part of that. Regulation chokes off jobs. Uh, schools that aren't producing the kind of workers that our employers need uh, affects that. So I think that our candidates have been focused on the right issues, the core issues that are going to decide this election. How do you grow jobs? How do we get our economy moving? How do we get government back under control so that it doesn't get in the way of private sector job creation? And Pat, have candidates been talking about how they would move that message forward if they are to indeed regain or remain in control of both the House and Senate here in Minnesota? I think they have. I think they've been very clear. I mean, I think the, the Republican-led legislature was very clear during the last session about some of the initiatives they'd move forward, but which were unfortunately vetoed by Governor Dayton. One, a bill that started to reform and lessen the burden of taxes on job creators. Some regulatory relief uh, to make it easier, especially when it comes to things like permitting. Uh, education reform so that we're keeping our best teachers in the classroom and we're paying back the money that state government has borrowed from school districts so that our, we're not just worried about how much money is government spending on education, but are our kids actually learning and being prepared for careers in the private sector? And you know, lessening the burden of rising health care costs, which is a which is a problem both for employers as they're trying to hire and workers as they're trying to you know to have to pay more each month in premiums and deductibles to try to you know bring some common sense and some more some more market based approaches uh, to health care, so that again uh, we have both more choices, quality care but we're not you know, laying a financial burden on top of uh, employers. We spoke with Dr. Larry Jacobs earlier in this program. He believes that Minnesotans are more polarized than ever and many are just going to vote party line this election. Do you, what, do you agree with that statement? Well, I certainly think so. I think you've got you know, two very different points of view in, in terms of how you govern the country and what works best. Uh, you know, uh, sort of a, the Obama, Dayton, DFL agenda, which is government directing the economy to try to have government more centrally involved in planning what's going to happen in terms of government spending directing the economy and, and in terms of St. Paul or Washington trying to to pick winners and losers and unfortunately as, as Mitt Romney pointed out in one of the debates too often government picks losers trying to you know have, have government spending driving the economy when instead it's got to be private employers the private sector and small business uh, leading the recovery and economic growth I mean it's, it's been well documented at all levels throughout this campaign you know, we have record high unemployment for duration purposes. We've got too many people on food stamps, too many people who can't find work. 
you know, things aren't as bad in Minnesota as they are nationally, but they're nowhere near what we find is acceptable. We always look at ourselves as an exceptional state, uh, that we're not just run-of-the-mill, that we're not just ordinary, we're not just like everybody else. And I think Minnesotans, I think they they're worried about that. They think we may be losing the things that made us unique and special because, uh, you know, government is getting so big and is, is getting in the way of so many of the relationships we have in our lives that it's preventing the best of Minnesota from coming out. Let's talk for a minute about the projected budget deficit. The numbers are, mm -hmm. are unclear at this point, of course, for the next biennium. But given that we will have Governor Mark Dayton, the DF, you know, a Democrat, as the leader, do you think Minnesotans are concerned at all that perhaps we might walk very close to that government shutdown line again, or that we might even cross it and have yet another one if the GOP remains in control? Honestly, I think Minnesotans are much more worried about a, another very large tax increase that Governor Dayton has proposed and seems, frankly, to be quite obsessed with. That his one agenda item that he wants and that he continues to talk about is yet another tax increase to make Minnesota among the nation's highest tax states with the nation's top income tax rate, which makes no sense. Uh, we're not competing just with China or India, but we're competing with Florida, with Arizona, and with Wisconsin, Iowa, the Dakotas, which are booming. We can't afford, Minnesota families can't afford another great big tax increase that's going to kill jobs and strike a blow at this economy. I so mean, you we, think the shutdown isn't even well, I don't think an it's issue an issue. I think Minnesotans are happy that Republicans were able to take a $6 billion budget deficit, turn it into a billion dollar surplus without raising taxes by reordering spending priorities. It wasn't a perfect solution, it wasn't an ideal set of circumstances, but in the end, this state, as with other states in this country, has to get spending under control and set some priorities for government. Otherwise, we're gonna have problems every two years for the foreseeable future. My last question for you, Pat, is how do you think the ballot initiatives might impact the legislative races? Do you think they might help or hurt the GOP? Well, you know, usually when people talk about ballot initiatives, they talk about them in terms of driving turnout one way or the other, but in Minnesota, in a presidential year, turnout's going to be very high. We show up to vote. Uh, so I don't think they're going to necessarily have an effect on legislative races. I think legislative races are determined by the quality of the candidate, how hard they work, and the message. And in our case, we've got good candidates who are working hard, who have the right message of fiscal responsibility through you know, tax and budget reform, getting people back to work, you know, reforming health care and education as well to keep good teachers in the classroom and make health care affordable. And I think as long as they continue to deliver those messages at the doors, you know, in the mailboxes, in the community, that they're going to do just great and we'll have legislative majorities come January. Okay, Pat Shortridge with those words. Thank you for your time and we want to apologize to you and to our viewers for the construction noise right outside of the Capitol. It's the light rail, can't stop progress. Thanks for having me. Chair of the Minnesota DFL Party, Ken Martin, joins me now to talk about the campaign and the election. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Ken, I want to begin with a quote that was made on October 13th in the St. Paul Pioneer Press by Senator David Hahn. He's the co-chair of the Senate GOP Campaign Committee. And he said, I don't want to sound overly optimistic, but I'd rather be in our position than the other guys at this point. Basically saying it's generally easier to defend seats than to defend incumbents. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think the DFL is in a great position to win back uh, both chambers uh, here in the next two weeks. Uh, certainly the issues on, are on our side. Uh, the candidates that we've recruited have been running great campaigns. And I think, uh, obviously, the only poll that matters is the poll on November 6th. But if the election were held today, I'm, I'm very confident we'd win back both chambers. We've got a lot of work to do. Uh, I appreciate what Senator uh, Han uh, is saying. Uh, he uh, is one of those senators that uh, has a lot of work to do in his own district. And frankly, I think we're going to win that seat here in, in two weeks. Has, how has the strong lead that President Obama holds in Minnesota kind of affected your efforts to try and regain the DFL majority in both well, the House and Senate? We certainly appreciate the work that's being done by the top of the ticket, both uh, as it relates to President Obama's race and Senator Klobuchar's race. And no doubt they'll have some coattail effect in terms of turnout and enthusiasm and driving Democrats to the polls. But the reality is, is that these legislative races are going to be decided uh, both by the issues and, and the uh, candidates themselves. And they're very local races. And so while there is some impact on turnout, the reality is a lot of these local races are somewhat insulated from national trends. And let's talk a little bit about the uh, the issues that could help or hurt the, tippet, the ticket. The constitutional amendment proposals, do you think those are going to help the DFL or 
or hurt it ultimately? Well, you know, I, I think in the end, uh, the Republicans made a very big mistake going into this election year uh, by putting those uh, on the ballot. Frankly, one of our Achilles heels, and, and it uh, bore itself out in 2010, was uh, the lack of enthusiasm in 2010 really impacted turnout. And as we headed into this election year uh, with non-competitive races on the top of the ticket with President Obama doing very well here and Senator Klobuchar in a, with a comfortable lead. The reality is what was going to generate that type of enthusiasm to make sure that our uh, base turned out and I think actually um, in, in, a, in a weird way the Republicans putting this on the ballot will actually help drive Democratic turnout this fall and help our candidates, particularly in some of those marginal races around the state. And I want to go back to something you said earlier about the uh, Klobuchar and the presidential races and, and the impacts that they may or may not have on the legislative races. We interviewed Dr. Larry Jacobs, and he contends that really what he's finding is Minnesotans are more polarized than ever, and they're going to vote party line. So by having a strong presidential lead in the state that's going to help you would you you're, you're I, think, I, I think that. it's true but I, I do think that what we see in legislative races in particular is that um, more often than not uh, you'll see those top of the ticket races drive turnout but the reality is is that people make their decisions on legislative races much more on, on, a, with a, on a local basis based on the issues based on the candidates themselves you'll see a lot of crossover votes for instance Republicans voting for Democrats Democrats voting for Republicans in legislative races, and and much less so on the top of the ticket races. And so, you know, what that suggests is yes, uh, the top of the ticket races help drive turnout, but the reality is people make their decisions uh, much more locally. And based on the issues, as you were talking about earlier, the DFL's goal it's the same as the Republican Party ultimately to create jobs and spur economic growth. But of course, the how to accomplish this differs greatly. How would Democrats try to move Minnesotans forward, given where we are today? Well, I think what we've we've seen the governor and and uh, leaders in the legislature, Democratic leaders in the legislature, put forward is a is uh, proposals to actually balance uh, the budget in a responsible way that actually would spur economic development. Uh, the reality is that, that the the only party that put forward any sort of serious jobs proposal in the last two legislative sessions was the DFL, uh, and the Republicans refused to uh, actually take that up. Uh, instead, they were focused on divisive constitutional amendments and social issues at the expense of doing what they said they would do when they campaigned, which was create jobs and lower lower taxes. The reality is, they, as I said, they haven't created any new jobs in this state because they refused to take up governor's bonding bill. The, they refused to take up the uh, governor's uh, jobs bill. Uh, and, and as it pertains to lowering taxes by repealing the market value homestead credit, we've seen uh, you know double-digit property taxes uh, increases throughout the state of Minnesota. And so um, the Republicans have a failed record, and what the Democrats have said is we can balance the budget in a responsible way and make uh, uh, reasonable cuts in government while at the same time uh, making sure we have revenue by uh, increasing the taxes on the wealthiest Minnesotans, thereby balancing the budget and uh, allowing us to actually invest in the things that make Minnesota a competitive business climate, uh, things like a strong uh, educated workforce, uh, making sure that we have a healthy populace, making sure that we're investing in amenities that draw corporations to this uh, state. I think a big misnomer that really bothers me is the Republicans always say that if you want to put a foreclosed uh, or close for business sign on the state of Minnesota, uh, the way to do that is to raise taxes. Well, taxes are just one small piece of what brings businesses to this state. And we know that by investing in the things that, uh, uh, you know, increase the business's bottom lines, that's what's going to bring bi businesses to Minnesota. Ken, according to a story that was done by AP writer Marty Galone uh, about a month ago, um, as candidates are hitting the campaign trail DFLers are reminding voters about the gridlock from the the shutdown the government shutdown and that if the DFL re retains or remains gains control excuse me such gridlocks just not going to happen again so do you think this is the message that's going to resonate with voters it is resonating I've been out at the doors a lot and it's sort of a pox on both houses right people are sick and tired of all the uh, the uh, uh, brinksmanship and the the stalemate and the uh, the shutdown uh, they want to see action people are really suffering out there and they want to see results they want their elected officials to actually um, start getting something done and what that means is we need to start electing reasonable people 
from both parties, but frankly the Republicans that have been elected in 2010, a lot of these Tea Party Republicans who represent a far-right extreme, have no interest in actually compromise or governing or working across the aisle to actually find uh, solutions to people's problems. And what I've said before is what we've seen now is a party that's been willing to put their oath to their political party ahead of the oath to the people that they were elected to serve. And the reality is we need more legislators and more candidates running for office who believe that their first responsibility is to serve the people they ser uh, they were elected by, not their political parties. And if we get to that point, both both sides are guilty of this, but if we get to that point, hopefully we won't have the same sort of um, you know stalemate and, and um, uh, shutdown that we saw in the last two years. What if the DFL gains control of one body but not the other? What, you, what kind of message do you think that sends to both parties about where Minnesota voters stand right now? Well, it's exactly what I just said. People want to see uh, results. They're sick and tired of seeing uh, non-action up at the Capitol because folks won't work together. Um, we need to put down the swords after the election is over and, and stop campaigning against each other and try to find ways to work with each other to govern. And if that's the result in two weeks here that uh, the voters send us uh, a, a divided legislature, then what they're saying is, uh, you know, let, let's grow up, let's uh, work together, let's find ways to compromise to actually solve the problems in this state. Okay, unfortunately we are out of time, but we'd like to chat with you after the elections and Absolutely. kind of discuss the results. So thank you for joining us. Thank Ken. you for having it. me. Really appreciate it. Current lawmakers continue to receive updates on the development of a health insurance exchange, which, if implemented, will allow for the online shopping and purchasing of health insurance. During the Legislative Advisory Commission meeting, an exchange took place that centered on unanswered questions and concerns. I have growing concern on behalf of Minnesotans that what we are doing uh, or what we see Governor Dayton and his administration doing is unilaterally obtaining federal funds with no legislative authorization or direction to build an infrastructure, both staffing and IT, to implement Obamacare in Minnesota, um, a, a virtual government takeover, certainly for 1.4 mil or 1.2 million Minnesotans, moving all these people into a government program or a set of government programs, basically, uh, with no assurance of where the money has come from or particularly what the impacts are. This is a very large project. You don't insure $1.2 million, make a market for 1.2 million Minnesotans without a little lead time. You don't just flip a switch and have an IT infrastructure that's there that will serve people in a way that they're accustomed to without some serious work and some serious thinking about the business processes. But there are some huge policy issues that you and others have raised and those need to be meted out in the legislative session. The governor intends to bring that forth. He said so, um, and that's literally why uh, this f uh, federal funds request is the size that it is. Discussions about an, a health insurance exchange in Minnesota long predate the Affordable Care Act. This is something that, you know, a, a, an online marketplace for people to shop for health insurance uh, and, and compare apples to apples and make sure that they're getting the proper information is a good idea regardless of who's putting it forward. And that's been recognized for a very long time. In fact, it was proposed by Republicans prior to the Affordable Care Act. That wraps up this week's program. Next week, we will take a look at the two ballot initiatives Minnesotans will vote on, voter photo ID, and the marriage amendment. So we hope to see you back here next week. Until then, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching.